Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Monday, November 30, 2015. Join us for the next 45 minutes as we deliver today's top stories around the globe. I am Angelo Castro III. We are here to give you carefully gathered stories, assuring you of accurate, truthful, and balanced newscasts. I am Jerry Alcantara. We are also seen in 1,360 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through www.untbweb.com. This is Wine News. News. Here are the headlines. The Hague Permanent Court of Arbitration is set to conclude its hearing on the territorial dispute case filed by the Philippines today. President Aquino shares Philippine experiences in dealing with calamities at the Climate Change Conference in Paris. PDP Laban formally endorses Davao City Mayor Rodrigo Duterte as the standard bearer in the 2016 presidential elections. The PNP Highway Patrol Group intends to set up an express lane in EDSA this holiday season. And UNTV and MCGI organize a medical mission for street dwellers and home for the boys, girls, and elderly in Manila Boys Town. First in the news, President Benigno Aquino III hopes that his trip to Paris will pave the way for better policies which will address climate change. Tell us why, Ann Nunez. World leaders gather in Paris, France starting November 30 to December 11 to attend the 21st Conference of the Parties or COP21. The COP21, a meeting of the heads of state, hopes to come up with an agreement that will pave the way for policies to address climate change. Aquino will deliver his speech at the Climate Vulnerable Forum in Paris, one of the high-level events of the COP21. Sa conference of the parties o COP21, ibabahagi natin sa ibang mga bansa ang ating karanasan sa pagharap at pagbangon sa matinding kalamaydad. Sa Climate Vulnerable Forum naman po, magsisilbi tayo ang tinatawa ng mga bansa ang pangunahing naapektuhan ng dumadalas at lumalakas na bugso ng kalamidad na dulot ng pagbabago sa klima. Aquino is set to meet with French President Francois Hollande and UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at the Parc des Expositions on Monday afternoon. This will be followed by the President's attendance to the opening ceremony of the Leaders' Event of the 21st Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change at 6 p.m. Aside from the Climate Change Conference, Aquino will also talk to owners of big companies in Paris. Sa paghikayat natin sa kanilang mamuhunan at magpalawak na negosyo dito sa Pilipinas, mas tumadami ang nalilikang pagkakataon para sa ating po mga kababayan. Aquino will also meet with the Filipino community in Paris. Gaya na lagi, lulubusin natin ang pagkakataon para masagad ang benepisyo ng biyayang ito para sa mga Pilipino. Ihayag natin sa mundo ang transformasyong nagagarap sa ating bansa at ang kakayahan nating makipagtulungan upang matupad ang ating kolektibong hangarin. Sama-sama po natin itaguyod ang isang liponang tinutugunan ng mga problema upang hindi na ito maipamana sa mga susunod sa atin. Patuloy po tayong magambagan at magmalasakit. Isabuhay natin ang diwa ng pagkakaisa at ang pagtahak sa isang landas tungo sa mas ligtas at mas masaganang kinabukasan. Tight security measures are being implemented around Paris for the international event. More than 2,800 police personnel have been deployed at the conference venue in Le Bourget to avoid a repeat of the November 13 Paris terror attacks that killed 130 people. After the conference in Paris, Aquino will head to Rome for an official meeting with Italian President Sergio Mattarella. And Nunez reporting for Wine News. The Hague Permanent Court of Arbitration will end its hearing on the maritime dispute case filed by the Philippines against China over the West Philippine Sea. Tell us why, Nel Maribohok. Today marks the deadline of the Hague Permanent Court of Arbitration in hearing the case filed by the Philippines against China on the West Philippine Sea territorial dispute. According to Presidential Spokesman Edwin Lacerda, today also serves as the last day of the Philippine delegation to present their evidence before the arbitration court, after which is the decision of the five members of the arbitral tribunal on whether to add more days of hearing for further clarification and then the issuance of its ruling on the case. The arbitration court began hearing the filed petition of the Philippines on November 24. 
Some of the merits of the case that was presented by the Philippine delegation were the reclamation activities that are being conducted by China at the West Philippine Sea and its massive effect on the marine resources, which is a clear violation of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS. The incident when China has blocked the Filipino fisher folks from entering the Scarborough Shoal and the illegal fishing activities being done by the Chinese fishermen were also presented before the tribunal. There are three issues in which the Philippines is looking forward to be resolved. First, the obligation and rights of the parties to the West Philippine Sea and how China's claim of the Nine Dash Line theory will affect the UNCLOS. Second, the issue on maritime entitlements on some islands and the activities being conducted by China over the West Philippine Sea which violates the convention such as the blocking of the Filipino fisher folks, construction and the fishing activities of China which creates extensive damage to the marine environment. Secretary Lacherda said that in the past hearings, the Philippines have presented evidence based on the international law. Malacanang hopes that the ruling of the arbitration court will favor the Philippines. The Hague Arbitral Tribunal is expected to award its decision on the case filed by the Philippines against China until the second quarter of 2016. Nel Maribuho, reporting for Y News. Despite being a non-working holiday today, some major roads in Metro Manila are experiencing moderate traffic this evening. Reporting from EDSA White Plains, Monokson will tell us why live. Mon. Regals, especially at classes and work, this holiday had loosened up heavy traffic in some major roads in Metro Manila this evening. Let us check the traffic situation. Starting from Munoz area, moderate traffic now near Dario Bridge, southbound lane due to the ongoing repair uh, by DPWH in um, Dario Bridge. After Munoz area, the traffic will loosen up until Nia Road. Light to moderate traffic will be experienced starting from Edsa Kamuning southbound all the way to Edsa Kubao Aurora. Traffic in Kubao Farmers in Edsa is also fast moving until Santolan flyover in front of Campo Crame. Light to moderate traffic is also expected southbound of Edsa, Connecticut, but slightly loosening approaching Ortigas area. Light traffic in front of SM Megamall but gradually building up approaching crossing underpass in Mandaluyo. Vehicles going Makati will start to slow down in Orense, Guadalupe, but light traffic in Buendia and Edsa, Ayala. Meanwhile, motorists will experience moderate traffic in Edsa northbound starting from Magallanes Interchange all the way to Ayala and in Buendia. Also in Orense, Guadalupe, Pioneer in Mandaluyong and Boni, and also in Edsa Shaw Boulevard. Light traffic starting from Mega Mall and Ortigas fly over northbound but moderate traffic in White Plains and slightly moving until Santolan, Cubao, Farmers, and Edsa, Cubao, Aurora. Light traffic will start in front of Mega Q Mart all the way to Nia Road and Quezon Avenue flyover. But traffic will start to build up from SM North until Munoz area. Jago, the number coding will resume tomorrow starting from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. All vehicles with plate numbers ending in numbers 3 and 4 is prohibited in all major roads in Metro Manila. And that's a traffic update. Back to you. Thank you, Mon Hoxon, reporting live from Edza White Plains. Aside from the Mabuhay Lane, the Highway Patrol Group, or HPG, is set to put express lanes in Edza, which will begin on the first week of December until the first week, week of January. Nel Maribok will tell us why. Orange barriers that were used during the recently concluded APEC summit will once again be put by the PMP Highway Patrol Group at the innermost lane of EDSA southbound. This will serve as the Christmas Express Lane. According to HPG Spokesperson Police Superintendent Grace Tamayo, this aims to cut the travel time of motorists from Shaw Boulevard all the way to Pasay. One lane din siya, maglalagay ng orange barrier. Ito ay mag-uumpisa sa Show Boulevard, papuntang Ayala, Buendia, at papuntang Pasay po. Tamayo also says that as orange barriers will be used in EDSA southbound, yellow barricade will then be situated along EDSA northbound and the thoroughfares near malls in order to keep public utility buses at the yellow lane. 
Tamayo further adds that shifting will be implemented among the 250 personnel of the HPG in order to maintain the management of traffic and lessen its heavy flow, especially along malls along EDSA. Aside from those who are assigned in EDSA from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. and 2 p.m. to 12 midnight, having a total of 122 personnel per shift, others will be assigned to conduct daily roving patrols from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Ibibase yung sa mga malls, na mga closing of malls, kasi 11 o'clock silang magko-close, dapat meron pa rin tao doon hanggang 12, kaya na-adjust namin yung deployment ng tao namin. The management of the HPG has also closely coordinated with the mall owners to enhance their parking system in order to prevent the long queue of vehicles which usually hampers the flow of traffic in EDSA. The newest traffic scheme of the Highway Patrol Group for the holiday season will be enforced on the first week of December and will last until the first week of January. Nel Maribuho, reporting for Y News. The Department of Transportation and Communication is requesting for access to the database of the National Bureau of Investigation. Nel Maribuhok is back to tell us why. The Department of Transportation and Communication is coordinating with the National Bureau of Investigation to have a copy of its negative list which will help the Land Transportation Office regulate the issuance of driver's license. Ang commitment namin noon ay kausapin ng NBI, yung suggestion ng uh, negative list, di ba? Uh, sisilipin din namin kung may pagkakataon bang may, may electronic link kami para ang, ang burden ay sa gobyerno kung paano makita yung database imbis na yung tao ang siyang naglalakad at uh, naghanap. Many people got annoyed when LTO included NBI and police clearances among the requirements in applying for driver's license. According to DOTC, they have ordered it to protect the commuting public. Protection ng ating mga pasero, magandang makita kung may mga criminal records o anumang warrants of arrest ang, ang nandyan. For now, DOTC has temporarily suspended the said requirements after Senators Franklin Drilon and Ralph Recto questioned the LTO over the complaints. Recto argues that it will be an additional cost to those applying for driver's license. An NBI clearance cost 115 pesos while a police clearance cost 170. Before you apply a police clearance, you still need to secure a barangay clearance which is an additional 50 pesos. Furthermore, a barangay clearance can only be released once you present a community tax certificate. As for police clearance, the PNP requires two ID photo that cost about 60 pesos. To sum up, an applicant would need to have about 400 pesos to be able to acquire an NBI clearance and the applicant still needs to wait up to two weeks before its release. Sa aking dapat, may pagkain dapat kami. Eh, pambili, lalo na pala. Next year, the Land Transportation Office is expecting to surge of about 2 million renewal applications aside from the first-time applicants. Nel Maribuho, reporting for Y News. The Commission on Elections insists that mall voting is not against the law. Victor Pasare will tell us why. Crowded and very hot. These are the situations in most of the voting precincts in the country on election days. Some polling precincts are situated not on the ground floor of public schools. That is why persons with disabilities find it difficult to vote. Some voters opt not to come out on election day due to the inconvenient voting process. These scenarios are what Comelec hopes to resolve in coming up with a proposal to conduct elections inside malls next year. Although some groups doubt its legality, the poll body insists that mall voting does not violate any existing laws. Sa ating omnibus election code, nakalagay naman that a polling place is a building or a place. No? Uh, at hindi naman sinasabing talagang dapat uh, lahat public. And the designation of polling places has to be something which is to be dynamic and not static. Kumbaga, dapat tinitignan din ng komisyon kung ano ba talaga ang mga tamang lugar uh, na gagamitin para nga mapabuti ang paraan ng pagboto. 
Bautista added the Republic Act 9369 or the Automated Election Law does not directly state that the place to be used for voting should be owned by the government. He also added that Batas Pambansa or BP 881, the main election law of the Philippines, is already an old law and the lawmakers that crafted the legislation were still looking at manual elections. Bautista said the election system in the country has already evolved and the number of voters has grown into a huge figure. The poll chief also noted that during the 2013 elections, not all precincts used were located in public schools. Of the more than 77,000 clustered precincts in the last national polls, 1,118 were situated in private establishments and more than 100 were rented by the government for 1.5 million pesos. In the planned mall voting, the spaces and malls that will be utilized for the purpose will be given free of charge. Bautista clarified that mall voting will make the voting experience more comfortable so more people would turn out to vote. But a critic of Comelec is against the idea. Attorney Glenn Chong stressed that if Comelec pushes for the implementation of mall voting, they will insist on the prohibition of carrying of firearms by mall guards deployed within the 100-meter radius of the voting center, and that no store or stall within the 30-meter radius of the polling center should open. They will also demand that Comelec release the information of mall owners and their shareholders because it is prohibited by law that a private establishment being used for elections is owned by a relative of a candidate. Victor Cosare reporting for Y News. Senator Grace Polskamp is hopeful that similar to the decision of the Senate Electoral Tribunal, the Commission on Elections will favor them and allow the senator to run for president in 2016. In the coming days, the Comelec is expected to issue a resolution over the complaints filed by Rizalito David accusing the senator of material misrepresentation on her COC during her senatorial candidacy in 2013. Attorney George Irwin Garcia, Post Legal Counsel, had previously announced that they would submit a manifestation together with a motion to dismiss David's election offense case, emphasizing the SET's favorable decision. Yung kasi nga sa COVID, ang issue doon ay pagiging kandidato sa pagkapangulo. Eh kung ikaw ay kwalipikado na bigyan magiging senador, kaparehas halos ang requirement, eh di parehas di ko ay kwalipikado rin magiging presidente. So sana ba bigyan din ang COVID ng bigat at uh, pagtingin yung naging decision ng Senate Electoral Tribunal. On December 3, Post Camp is set to submit a memorandum against all other disqualification cases filed by former Senator Francisco Tatad, political science professor Antonio Contreras, and former University of the East College of Law Dean Amado Valdez. Davao City Mayor Rodrigo Duterte is the standard bearer of the Partido Democratico Pilipino Lakas ng Bayan or PDP Laban in the 2016 presidential elections. Grace Cassin will tell us why. Davao City Mayor Rodrigo Duterte lays his platform of government as PDP Laban's presidential bet in the election next year. Duterte was formally proclaimed this afternoon, hosted by Senator Coco Pimentel, the party's president, and its former national president, Mike Sueño. They rejoiced over Duterte's decision as they now have a standard better that aims to further improve the country. Also in the event is Senator Alan Peter Cayetano, who is Duterte's running mate. Supporters of Duterte Cayetano tandem flock the venue. Duterte pushes for federalism, faster business transactions, countering crime, and inclusive peace talks. But with all this, Duterte still insists it is not his ambition to run as president. Well, ang address ko is uh, one of happiness. Uh, salamat sa Diyos. At uh, finally, nagklaro na, naging klaro na po. Meron na pong kandidato ang PDP Laban, kandidato ng bayan, pagkapangulo na Republika ng Pilipinas. The, the, the mayor of the world's, one of the world's safest cities, walang iba, Mayor Rodrigo Duterte. Imagine a president without an extraordinary talent. Well, I'm happy, I'm confident. Pramihan dito, PDP. It's always the practice to give the president the right for the privilege to, cho to choose his uh, running mate. So ako naman si Alan, sabi niya, ready ako. And he was always with me. And he is very good, very intelligent, and 
Vicente, kagaya ni Kukoy, ganito yan. Kung hindi kayo magboto kay Alan, huwag na niya pong butuhin. Duterte challenges his critics and those opposing his candidacy that he is not afraid whoever wishes to file a disqualification case against him at the Comelec. He said in case a disqualification case prosper against him, he is willing to retire as he has been in the government office for a long time already. Grace Gasson reporting for Y News. A vice presidential forum was held at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Reporting from UP Diliman, Joyce Balancho will tell us why live. Yes, Joyce. Yes, good evening, Diego. All of our vice presidential candidates were invited in a forum here at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, but only Senator Cheese Escudero and Congressman Lenny Nobredo accepted the challenge of taking in tough questions from UP students. Their answers to most of the questions, if not the same, are almost similar in most issues. Senator Escudero and Congressman Robredo, both alumni of the UP Diliman, face youth leaders today. Several issues concerning the country were asked to our vice presidential candidates, such as their take on the Philippines' unpreparedness for the ASEAN integration. Both said the country should not back out from a big opportunity such as the ASEAN, which will help businesses thrive in the Philippines. Congressman Robredo mentioned that the government agencies should double their efforts in making sure that the Philippines will be equipped for the integration. The TESDA, for example, should strengthen their training programs for workers and the Department of Trade and Industry and Department of Labor and Employment to add support to our small and medium enterprises. Aside from the ASEAN integration, candidates were also interrogated on their personal view on the territorial dispute with China. Both also mentioned that they are agreeing with the take of the current administration to resort to only peaceful negotiations, such as the arbitrary case and the UNCLOS. Senator Escudero, however, said the country should be open to bilateral talks with China. Since the forum was organized by UP students, it was inevitable that the issues on budget cuts on state universities and colleges be asked to the candidates. Congressman Robredo said she does not agree with reducing the budget, edu budget of education as it is detrimental in human capital development. Senator Escudero, on the other hand, mentioned that as a former chairperson of the Finance Committee of the Senate, he had long been approving additional budget to tertiary education. The student also asked the candidates to, to rate the current administration based on its achievements and shortcomings. Congressman Robredo gave the Aquino administration 7 to 8 points out of 10 for passing controversial bills that needed strong political will, such as the sin tax law and the reproductive health law. On the other hand, Senator Escudero gave a 6 to 7 points for the anti-corruption campaign of the Aquino administration. However, both agreed that the government could have resolved issues of underspending and should have passed important bills such as the Freedom of Information Bill. When asked of the responsibilities of the vice president, both resented the idea of just being a spare tire of the president. Congressman Robred stressed that the vice president takes the heavy job of bringing the government closer to the people and that that position entails going at grassroots level and making sure that the public knows and feels the direction of the country and be there for the people when the president cannot. Diego, the event was jam-packed with students as well as supporters, mostly of Congressman Lenny Robredo. And then after the forum, both candidates granted media interviews and took in tough questions from the press, which were limited during the forum. Diego? Thank you, Joyce Balancho, reporting live from UP Diliman. The government and MILF peace panel have asked Congress, through an open letter, to immediately pass the BBL. Tell us why, Grace Cassin. The government and the MILF fear that Congress is not tackling important laws like the Bangsamoro Basic Law because of the lack of quorum. In an open letter signed by Government Peace Panel Chairman Prof. Miriam Coronel Ferrer and MILF Peace Panel Chairman Mohogeric Pal, they stated that enacting the BBL into a law would bring peace in Mindanao. They emphasized that this is also a way to the decommissioning of thousands of weapons and members of the MILF. And passing the BBL can help prevent extremist groups like ISIS on entering Mindanao. In particular, they ask leaders of both Houses of Congress and as well as House Ad Hoc Committee Chairman Rufus Rodriguez and Senate Local Government Committee Chairman Ferdinand Marcos Jr. to act and pass the BBL. 
As of now, there are only three weeks left before the session break on December 17. The Congress, however, had stopped tackling the BBL since last week because of the lack of quorum. In the House of Representatives, the BBL is still in the period of interpolation and debate where there are still 10 congressmen who are next in line to question the content of the bill. On the other hand, the bill is still pending in the Senate committee level. Grace Gasser reporting for Y News. Department of Agriculture Secretary Proceso Alcala leads the groundbreaking ceremony of the Agri Pinoy Trading Center in Javier Leyte. Joyce Balancho will tell us why. As part of the programs of the Department of Agriculture or DA, the Northeastern Leyte Agri Pinoy Trading Post will be put up to help in the livelihood of farmers. DA Secretary Proceso Alcala graced the event and led the groundbreaking ceremony attended by hundreds of farmers in the province. In cooperation with the local government unit, the department turned over the budget that will be part of the construction of the training post. It will be built in this one-hectare property where the program was commenced. This will serve as a center point where trade of agricultural products in the province will be held. According to Mayor Leonardo Javier, the project will help in improving the income of farmers. Through the trading post, income will directly be channeled to farmers as there will be no need for middlemen. To facilitate better trade, the local government also fixed roads which will be used to deliver products. Kung ang ating trading post ay matino na po at tumatakbo na maganda, we can easily buy your products, take it to Luzon para mas maganda ang presyo at doon naman po sa mahal ng presyo ng luya, bababa ng konti. To maximize the good source of water in town, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources or BFAR will also extend assistance to the fishing industry of Javier. Nagawaran ang pangisdaan ay magbibigay po ng iba-ibang klaseng binhi patadamihin sa lahat ng ating pong tubig na dumadaloy sa bayan ng Javier. Magbibigay po sila ng karpa na atin pong pakakawalan sa mga ilo, sapa at saka po mga irrigation canals ito. Isang daan libo po na karpa ang kanilang pakakawalan. In the town of Palo Leyte, on the other hand, the Department of Agriculture also granted fund to some rural development programs. More than 700 million pesos worth of projects are awarded to provide additional machines, boats, seedlings and other necessities of the agricultural sector. Joyce Balancho reporting for Y News. Two FA-50 trainer jets from South Korea were delivered to the country today. Tell us why Grace Kassin. Two FA-50 fighter trainer jets have arrived in the country as a part of the Philippine Air Force's efforts to modernize its aircraft. The two jets landed on the Clark Air Base in Angeles City, Pampanga on Saturday. These were flown by two Korean pilots and escorted by the Philippine Air Force's S-211 aircraft. The two fighter trainer jets are the first of the PAF's 12 newly ordered jets from South Korea. Defense Secretary Volker Gasmin said FA-50 is supersonic and has a top speed of Mach 1.5 which is faster than the speed of sound. We're glad we're finally back to supersonic age. The jets were bought by the Philippine government for 18.9 billion pesos. This can carry out multi-role missions such as patrolling Philippine territories and can be fitted with heat-seeking and air-to-air -air missiles and light automatic cannons. Primarily, it is a lead-in fighter trainer. So, Bali, uh, we are. This, this is going to be a transition platform for us to fly the from flying the subsonic S-211 to the more advanced uh, multi-role fighters that we will be acquiring in the future. Early this year, the PAF sent three of its pilots to undergo a six-and-a-half-month training in South Korea in operating the FA-50. One of them is Lieutenant Colonel Rolanda Conrad Peña. The training was tough because we had to learn the system of the aircraft because it is a fly-by-wire aircraft, so uh, it's really different from what we used to fly. The rest of the fighter trainer jets are set to be delivered to the country by 2017. Grace Gasson reporting for Y News. The task force Davao has intensified security measures in city terminals as the holiday season nears. Victor Cosare tells us why. 
The task force Davao has intensified and tightened security in city terminals following bombing incidents in Mindanao in previous weeks. In the Davao City Overland Transportation Terminal in Echoland, the lines dedicated for baggage inspection were raised to four from the previous two. The task force Davao strictly inspects passengers' baggage for explosive devices, ammunition, and illegal items, especially as the influx of passengers is expected to become more pronounced as the holiday season nears. Upat o tolo kalinya, so na yung mga lalaki, na yung mga babae, so priority na to dere ang kaning mga senior citizen, so o kaning mga buntis. The Davao City Police also ordered that UV Express services entering the city be escorted by marshals and tracker teams. On November 18, two people were injured in an explosion inside a commercial van at the Echoland Terminal. Every time na yung nakikita natin yung mga vans na nasa highway, sinusundan po yan ng ating mga police na lalo na pagpapasok na dun sa mga crime-prone areas natin. Passengers welcome the tighter security measures implemented by authorities. Okay ra, mas maayo nang may inspection kay kuan o ligtas ta sa unsa nga kuan may tabo o safety. Mas maayo yun na siya kay safety ba. Okay ra na sa mua kay haron walay karon halo karon walay mga panghitabo wa nga kung nabay mga bomba ana di ma-check jud. The DCPO will also conduct operations against illegal terminals of Colorum vans in Davao City. Meanwhile, authorities are still running after the man who allegedly planted an improvised explosive device inside the UV Express at the Echoland Terminal. Police also appeal for the public's cooperation in the manhunt operation. The task force Davao is also uh, conducting its own investigation and perhaps uh, we will wait for their own investigation to come out and then it will uh, be brought to the attention of the Commanding General of the NID, and then uh, we will uh, do proper action on that. Victor Cosare reporting for Y News. Y News will be right back. Cloudy conditions with up to moderate rains will be experienced in several, several Luzon areas tomorrow, Tuesday. Reporting from Quezon City, Bianca Dava will tell us why. Good evening everyone. Two weather systems are responsible for the cloudy conditions and rains that will be experienced over several Luzon areas on the first day of December tomorrow. So these are the northeast monsoon or Amihan affecting northern and central Luzon and the tail end of a cold front affecting southern Luzon. For the first day of December tomorrow, the Bicol region and the province of Quezon will experience cloudy conditions accompanied by up to moderate rains. While the same cloudy conditions but only light rains will be felt over the region of Cagayan Valley and the province of Aurora. This is due to the tail end of a cold front. The Ilocos region, Cordillera, and the rest of central Luzon, meanwhile, will be cloudy with isolated light rains, this time due to the prevailing northeast monsoon or Amihan. The rest of the country will be partly cloudy, but with isolated rain showers or thunderstorms, especially in the afternoon. Moderate to strong winds blowing from the northeast will prevail over Luzon and the Visayas, where coastal waters will be moderate to rough. Elsewhere, winds will be light to moderate from the northeast with slight to moderate seas. Everyone can watch the sunrise on Tuesday at 6.05 a.m. and catch the sunset at 5.25 p.m. And that was a snapshot of the weather for the first day of December tomorrow. So for provinces affected by the two weather systems, be sure to bring out your parasols or umbrellas and brace up for a rainy but blessed day. And of course, for everyone, be wary of the weather and keep watching out for updates. Reporting live for Y News, I am Bianca Dava, back to studio. Thank you, Bianca, reporting from Quezon City. 
Malakanang Malakanyang Patriots cut the five-game winning streak of the AFP Cavaliers in the beginning of the second round eliminations of the UN TV Cup Season 4 at the Inares Sports Arena in Pasig. Nel Maribuhok will tell us why. The Malacanang Patriots ended the AFP Cavaliers' winning streak after a big victory in the beginning of the second round of eliminations at 85-75. At the start of the game, Patriots guard Visnu Dasavier released back-to-back -to -back three point shots to show the team's determination to win. Through Messina's back-to-back -back scores during the last five minutes of the match, the Patriots mark its largest advantage of 18 with a final score of 73-55. The Cavaliers, which tried to catch up until the last quarter, was not able to execute a good play. Against the offensive moves from Malacanang through power forward Jenkins Messina and shooting guard Andrew Request, who were hailed as the best players of the game. Messina made 15 points and 5 rebounds, while Request scored 12 points and grabbed 5 rebounds. Malacanang is set to battle against MMDA on December 4. Meanwhile, the BFP Firefighters bagged their fourth win, furthering in team standings at 5 win, 1 loss, and tying with AFP Cavaliers in team standing after beating Senate defenders at 74-72. Fire volunteer Marlon Adolfo was hailed best player of the game, having 34 points, including 6 3 points, 3 rebounds, 2 steals, and a block. Senate defenders playing coach Kenneth Duremdes contributed 12 points and 8 boards before being ejected from the playing court in the first half of the game. BFP will be facing defending champion Judiciary Magis on December 9. Meanwhile, MMDA Black Wolves stood out against NHA Builders at 78-76. During the last 36 seconds of the last quarter, the two teams tied at 75 all after NHA's Antonio Lustestica Jr. released a three-point shot. But the Wolves returned on play with Jeffrey Sanders. Sanders bagged 32 points, 14 rebounds, while Cyril Santiago and Ronnie Santos added 11 points and 7 rebounds each. Meanwhile, builder Antonio Lustestica Jr. also marked 32 points, 5 rebounds and 1 assist, steal and block. However, NHA set back in standings with 3-3 win-loss record ahead of its battle with Judiciary Magis on December 4. Nel Maribuho, reporting for Y News. Thousands rally in Moldova's capital calling for a referendum and denouncing corruption. Meanwhile, thousands of demonstrators march through the streets of Rome and Amsterdam. Anunyas tells us why. In Europe, thousands of activists marched through streets of Amsterdam and Rome on Sunday, November 29, to urge action on a global scale on the eve of UN Climate Summit in Paris. Around 7,000 people marched through Amsterdam in a bid to pressure politicians into finding solutions and reducing the effects of climate change. In Rome, crowds gathered at Campo dei Fiori close to French embassy as a show of solidarity to France after the November 13 attacks before marching through the historical center towards Piazza Venezia. Many held placards reading, There is no Planet B. The demonstration in Rome was part of the more than 2,000 climate events planned in cities across the world, making it one of the biggest days of action on climate change in history. In Haiti, songs of Haitians took to the streets on Sunday, November 29, to continue their protests against results from the October 25 election after official tallies were announced last week. Haiti's Provincial Electoral Council, CEP, confirmed that government-backed candidate Jovenel Moise will face Jude Celestine, the former head of Haiti's state construction company, in a runoff vote next month. Haitians will go to the polls on December 27 for the runoff. In Moldova, thousands of anti-government demonstrators rallied in Moldova's capital on Sunday, November 29, calling for a referendum on returning direct presidential election. Currently, the president is appointed by parliament. Protesters taking part in the nationwide demonstrations gathered in the capital and other towns also denounced corruption and called for better governance. Demonstrators direct much of their viral fire at the country's super-wealthy oligarchs who control key sectors of the economy. Civic platform Dignity and Truth DA has been staging rallies in the capital, calling for the government to step down. And Nunez reporting for Y News.
Over 6,000 Star Wars fans in Brazil gathered to compete in a night race where runners were assigned to the dark or light side of the force. Meanwhile, Mexico brings together 294 people dressed as members of the Beatles, breaking the world record. Francis Ong will tell us why. Mexico on Saturday broke the world record for gathering together the largest number of people dressed as members of the iconic rock band The Beatles. 294 people gathered in Mexico City's Chapultepec Park, dressed in costumes reflecting the group's various styles over the decades. The audience cheered as the final tally was announced. Fan club president Ricardo Calderon said Mexico was proud of its fan base. Que una vez más la vitlemanía mexicana se hace notar a nivel mundial. Siempre hemos sido conocidos por tener conciertos muy fuertes para Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney adora estar en México por la reacción de la gente. Ringo Starr se volvió loquito también cuando estuvo aquí en su, ha estado aquí en sus conciertos. Hemos tenido, tenemos más, yo considero más bandas tributo a los Beatles en México que en cualquier otro país del mundo. Although the 294 tally appears to have broken the previous record that stood at 250, Mexico will need to send the paperwork into Guinness for official verification. Meanwhile, thousands of Star Wars fans ran a 7-kilometer night race in Brazil's business capital Sao Paulo on Saturday, gathering Princess Leia's and Darth Vader's from all parts of the country. The runners could choose between competing for the Dark Side of the Force or the Jedi Order, represented by black and white shirts handed out by organizers. The more enthusiastic fans wore costumes and held lightsabers as they trotted down one of the city's main roads which closed for the event. This is the second edition of the Star Wars-themed run in Brazil. Among the Darth Vaders, Luke Skywalkers and Princess Leia's, the force was strongest with Zenaid Vieira and Andre Alberi, who both won medals after crossing the finish line in less than 25 minutes. Precious Ong reporting for Y News. Rizal High School believes that Kuya Daniel's birthday concert last week will help their reading program significantly. Bianca Dava will tell us why. The Rizal High School is one of the biggest secondary schools in the Philippines, which has more than 8,800 students. It is not an easy task for more than 340 teachers to guide the students, especially in reading because each of them has 250 learners or 50 learners per classroom. They also found out that there are students who are already in 7th grade but still could not read. This prompted the school to come up with a reading program. So, ginawa namin ng para nito. Nagkaroon kami ng training with an expert. Nagkaroon kami ng workshop. At balak pa namin itong palawigin ngayong taon. John is one of those who benefited from the reading program. Ang dami ko po ginagawa dati. Nag-iigib po. Tapos, nag-aano po kami ng kaoy. Tapos, ibibinta namin sa isda. Teachers use preschool style of teaching for students like John. Nag-uumpisa ako doon sa sound ng alphabet and then uh, kinukumbayan ko yung, yung dalawang letter and uh, hanggang tatlo, ganun, hanggang makabuo kami ng word. For the teachers, it is also important that parents support their children in their studies. Imagine nyo na hindi nila alam na hindi marunong magbasa yung mga anak nila. The teachers also see big hope that students can improve their reading skills by pushing for the RIPE or Reading Intervention Program Enhancement. They have proven this in the last National Achievement Test or NAT for public schools in Pasig. Napakalaki po ng population natin na nang tayo po ay nag-second place sa kabila ng laki ng ating populasyon ay talaga pong sobrang natuwa naman din po ang Rizal High School. The Rizal High School is one of the beneficiaries of Kuya Daniel's birthday concert that received 100,000 pesos. They will use the amount for additional reading materials and special training for teachers to be able to intensify the program and develop the reading skills of students. Kami nga po ay nagpapasalamat sa aming mga stakeholders na katulad nyo UNTV kasi yung suporta nyo ay napakalaki. Gaya nga po sa reading and I'm grateful to you 
dahil malaking tulong ang UNTV sa aming reading program. Bianca Dava, reporting for Y News. Street dwellers, orphan boys and girls, and the elderly staying at the Manila Boys Town Complex in Marikina have enjoyed a day of health and medical care. Victor Casale will tell us why. 75-year-old Rolando is one of those living at the Manila Boys Town Complex in Marikina. He has been residing there for 15 years now because he no longer has relatives who could take care of him. Despite this, Rolando remains happy. Yan, sa kanya nga lang ako kumukuha ng kalakasan sa Panginoon dahil wala na akong ibang aasahan pa eh. The center head of the Luwalhati ng Maynila Home for the Aged said most of the elderly at the Manila Boys Town are orphaned. Today, UNTV and the members Church of God International conducted a medical mission at the Manila Boys Town Complex. There are four types of residents cared for by the local government of Manila, street families, orphaned girls and boys, and the elderly. Eleven families and more than 100 individuals were rescued by the government from the streets of the metropolis and are currently living in the complex. Aside from this, around 200 girls and boys and 300 elderly are being cared for by the government. All of them were rendered free medical services by UNTV and the MCGI. These include free medicines, medical checkup, eye checkup, dental checkup, ECG, X-ray, CBG, CBC, and urinalysis. The group also gave away 200 chairs and 20 wheelchairs to the home for the aged. Prior to the medical mission, Kuya Daniel Razon and the MCGI held a feeding program and gave 100,000 pesos as financial assistance to the Manila Boys Town during the recently concluded In the Eyes of a Child concert. The Manila Boys Town hopes that UNTV and the MCGI will continue reaching out to the public, especially those who are in need. Para kay Brother Eli Suriano at kay uh, Kuya Daniel, ha? congratulations sa inyo. At of course sa mga iba namumuno dito sa UNTV 37 at sa mga members, no? sa mga inyong mga lokal, marami ang inyong maitutulong sa mga nangailangan. Kaya... Maraming maraming salamat sa inyo. Mula sa puso ng luwalhati ng Maynila Home for the Aged, uh, congratulations at God bless. Victor Cosare, reporting for Y News. Before the newscast ends, on behalf of the Y News family and the whole UNTV, I would like to greet my partner, my co-anchor, Angelo Diego Castro III. Uh, it's his 40th... Oops! Was I supposed to reveal your age? Nah. It's his birthday today! We have a little something for you. Thank you. Life begins at 40, Jerry. Yeah. yeah. Happy birthday to you. Oh, happy so birthday yeah. to Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday, birthday to you! Happy birthday, Thank Jags. you. I'd like to say thank you to, of course, Queen Danielle and, of course, uh, the UNTV family, Y News, Ma'am Nina, Ate Ruth, of course, Ate Maris for guiding me and uh, to this trans transition to being 40. Wow. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Those are the reasons behind the news, November 30, 2015. I'm Angelo Castro III. The reasons we delivered to you as they unfold. I'm Jerry Alcantara. Because we need to know. We will always ask why. Thank you for watching. Why News.